Okay, so our first chapter in our evolution unit is chapter 19, Evolution Forms Most Beautiful. And before we can really talk about Darwin and his role in, our, in the theory of evolution, we're going to look at the history and the thinking leading up to Darwin. So we have Aristotle in the 300 BCs that viewed life as fixed and unchanging. Um, and that kind of remained the, the thought for hundreds of years. Um, Carol Linnaeus in the 1700s still um, agreed that life was created as is and is unchanging. Um, however, he worked to start to classify organisms. As um, naturalists and people interested in science and nature um, moved, not moved, traveled throughout the world and collected specimens from the rainforest or grasslands, they sent them back towards um, to Le England. And Linnaeus decided to um, start to classify them. And he worked on the nomenclature or the naming of species. So when we say that humans are homo sapiens, that's an example of uh, a binomial or two name, like a way to call us or identify us. Whereas fruit flies are Drosophila melanogaster or E. coli, etc. And then you have um, Georges Cuvier. We can also tie in like paleontology and the fossil record um, when we look at life and how it's changed on Earth. And so um, Cuvier started to look at the rock layers or the different strata in rocks, and you he would notice that like at the bottom layers, all of a sudden there might be a layer where organisms or animals that were in the bottom layers never occur afterwards. And the new species would be in the top rock layers. And so the way he explained this was that the bottom layers, um, those organisms were wiped out or extinct because of some catastrophe. And any new animal forms that are above that in the higher up rock level layers are because of immigration of species, new species into that area. Um, around this time period, it was common, commonly believed that the earth was about 6,000 years old. So to explain such drastic changes in the fossil record, the uh, catastrophism makes sense. Um, and then we have two uh, gentlemen who were working in the field of geology and looking at earth's features. We have James Hutton and Charles Lyell, who both... Um, were interested in uh, like the formation of canyons, like Grand, like the Grand Canyon, or rivers, or valleys, or mountains. And when we look at Hutton, Hutton uh, realized that the formations of of Earth were slow, gradual processes that probably took millions of years, longer than what was thought of just six thousand of the age of the Earth. Um, and Lyell um, added to that by saying. Um, that these changes, these geological happenings, were still occurring. And so these two gentlemen and their idea that um, there's processes on Earth that take millions of years it greatly influenced Darwin as he was traveling around the world on the HMS Beagle. Because that idea that, wow, maybe the Earth is older than 6,000 years, um, that could explain some of the observations, which, of course, we'll talk more about Darwin soon. Um, and so Darwin eventually came up with this hypothesis of um, basically natural selection or descent with modification. Now, before Darwin, though, uh, there was a, a gentleman named Lamarck. And Lamarck, um, uh, while he wasn't the only one to suggest that life, or the first one to suggest that life evolves on Earth, um, he was one of the first ones to propose how life on Earth uh, could change over time. And so uh, he publishes Apothesis in 1809, which coincidentally is the year that Darwin was born. So he did study the fossil record, um, and his conclusions of how life can evolve on Earth were based on two principles. The first one, use and disuse. The idea that body parts that are used extensively become larger and stronger, while those that are not used deteriorate. Um, the second principle, as the common example with Lamarck, is the giraffes. If they just stretch their neck long enough, it'll be longer, and then they'll get that food. Um, and so when we look at uh, his second principle, which is inheritance of acquired characteristics, that stated that these acquired characteristics, that gir giraffe with the longer neck, uh, could be passed on to offspring. Um, so basically this idea that if we strive to have certain characteristics during life, um, that they'll be passed on uh, to our offspring. So things that are acquired. Uh, it's a little joke about a woman working out while she was pregnant and then having a physically fit offspring. Um, 
which we know is testable and doesn't really work this way. So Lamarck thought that evolution happens because organisms have this innate drive to become more complex. Um, we since we now know a little bit more about inheritance and DNA and genetics, and uh, we see that traits that we acquire through life, like right now my hair is bleached blonde, um, just because I've acquired it in life because I wanted blonde hair doesn't mean my offspring are going to be born with blonde hair. Okay. Uh, now Darwin here uh, proposed uh, descent with modification by natural selection. So this explains the adaptations of organisms and the unity and diversity of life. Um, so in the 1800s, the prevailing thought was that life remained unchanged since creation, and very few questioned it, which makes Darwin a lightning rod for revolutionary view of life. His book was like a bestseller. So um, I liked this quote here that it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. So the whole idea about natural selection is that when environments change, some individuals will be able to survive better and reproduce better than others. So um, this is another quote. Uh, There's grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been origi originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that, whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. Okay, so let's look about Darwin some more. So Darwin uh, was a little unsure of what he wanted to do in life. He was always really interested in uh, nature and stuff, but his dad really wanted him to become a doctor. So he goes, um, tries out maybe medical school, realizes it's not for him. Uh, kind of like a young man, early 20s, a little unsure. Um, you know, does he go into ministry and become a religious person? Does he become a doctor against his interests? And then, as luck would have it, this um, gentleman named Fitzroy, a captain on a ship, um, was going on a, a boat ride, a ship ride. Uh, it was supposed to be about two years to chart the coast of South America. So the boat was called the HMS Beagle. And uh, Fitzroy was a little kooky, and so uh, he was looking for a companion, someone of the same social class as him to have conversations with on the ship because um, he was a little snooty and didn't want to talk to the, the working class on the ship throughout the, the length of the voyage. Anyway, so Darwin's like, sure, I don't know what's going on in life right now. He decides to go as a companion to Fitzroy, and they uh, go and they chart the course of South America. They travel around the world. Uh, what started out as two years actually ends up being a five-year journey. And really, though, since their main course was to chart uh, South America, uh, they made a lot of stops along the way. And when they'd stop, Darwin was first to get off the ship and would go and explore the coastlines and go and explore nature. He collected specimens of organisms and brought them back to England. He kept them on the ship in jars and preserved them and kept drawings and detailed notes of what he saw. And as he charted South America, um, the South American coastline, he realized he saw Brazil, the jungles, and we looked at the Argentina grasslands and then the t towering peaks of the Andes. And what he started to notice is what the animals there were suited to their environment and that how fossils were similar to the living species. So when he'd see fossils um, in one area, he could see the living species in that same area were just a little bit different um, than the fossils. He also noticed that the temperate, um, the animals from like the temperate ecosystems were very different than the ones from Europe. So um, he also, during this time period, read about Lyell read Lyell's book, um, The Principles of Geology, about how Earth could possibly be millions of years old. Um, another thing that influenced his thinking while on this trip was um, he actually experienced an earthquake while he was on the coastline that actually, like, shifted um, rocks and stuff, and he saw all of a sudden, like, um, fossils be exposed in the side of the mountain, and he saw seashells high up in the Andes. And so... Um, he began to realize that Earth, wow, must be older than just a few thousand years. And then he visited the Galapagos. And the Galapagos are a series of islands right around the equator. Um, and the one thing he studied were the mockingbirds on the island, uh, on the different Galapagos islands. So the mockingbirds, some were unique to specific islands, some to many islands, but and most were not known anywhere else in the world. 
So his hypothesis was that, hmm, that the Galapagos had been colonized by organisms that had strayed from South America and then diversified, giving rise to new species on various islands. So if each island has their own specific habitat, different traits would be selected for, etc. And so when we look at the Galapagos, they're home to a bunch of unique animals that are found only in the Galapagos. So it was like a, a hot spot for biodiversity and um, a field of study. So Darwin, though, as he's observing these animals, he began to focus on adaptations. When well, adaptation is an inherited characteristic of an organism that enhances its survival and reproduction in specific environments. Take these two rabbits. Obviously, they're both rabbits. They have a common ancestor of a rabbit, but because they live in different environments, they have different inherited traits or characteristics that increase their chance of survival. Take the desert rabbit. The jackrabbit has large ears, so its heat can um, evaporate, and it can have evaporative cooling and lower its body temperature since it's a, an endotherm. Versus the snowshoe hare has shorter ears covered in lots of fur to try and keep itself warm uh, against the challenges of heat loss in a cold environment. Um, so inherited characteristics, um, that's the key with adaptation, that it's inherited traits that increase the survival and reproduction in specific environments. Think about a camel who lives in very dry environments. They have lots of fat stores so they can break it down during cell respiration and make water. So that's an adaptation to that dry environment, increasing their chance of survival. Here, a pufferfish puffs up with its spines. Those spines are adaptations that increase its chance for survival. They talk about reproduction, the blue-footed boobies of the Galapagos. Their bright blue feet tell their mate or their potential mate, hey, look how healthy I am. So those blue feet don't help their survival, but they help them in reproduction. So when we look at um, uh, adaptations, these are traits or characteristics that an organism is born with that increase their chance of surviving and reproducing in a particular environment. So when I say particular environment, that's very important. Think about this snowshoe hair right here. This snowshoe hair, those adaptations, I mean those traits Lots of fur, short ears. That's an adaptation for living in cold weather. You take that snowshoe hair and you move it to the desert, it's no longer an adaptation. That's going to hinder its chance of survival and reproduction. Okay, so Darwin realized that adaptations and the origin of new species were actually related. So Darwin goes back to England after five years on the HMS Beagle, and he spends years uh, doing research. Testing out his hypothesis, gathering evidence. He worked with pigeons. He worked with worms. He did breeding experiments and artificial selection. Um, and so how Darwin is different from Lamarck is because he um, basically was able to present a plausible, specific mechanism with immaculate logic and an avalanche of evidence. He spent years studying natural selection before he came out and presented his hypothesis. Now, let's talk more about that. So the time period of the 1800s was very strong that the Earth was 6,000 years old. And so uh, for Darwin, realizing that natural selection is a very slow process, um, or can be a slow process to create new species and all the diversity of life, was very hesitant about coming out and saying this because it would go against the religious beliefs of the time. Um, so much so that it made him sick. He was... Um, uh, had lots of different ailments throughout his life, and um, about 20 years or so, he kept his mouth shut. He actually had his hypothesis written out and in a safe and told his wife, if I die, make sure you publish this. I want to get credit, but he wasn't quite ready to um, be so contradictory. And so he did breeding experiments with pigeons, um, and basically what he presented was this descent with modification, that over millions of years, descendants of ancestors accumulated diverse modifications or adaptations that fit them to a certain way of life. Eventually, this led to a rich diversity of life on Earth today. You can see here the evolution of horses over 50 million years, how the, depending on their environment, uh, they get longer legs and different teeth, and uh, we'll talk more about that in class. Now, Darwin, though, he didn't, it was more of a reluctance publish of The Origin of Species. There was another naturalist, Alfred Russell Wallace, studying um, uh, populations in Indonesia that actually spurred Darwin to get, like, um, noticed for his hypothesis of natural selection. And so, therefore, he published The Origin of Species in 18, 
58? 